Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what a fantastic conference. Look how many people here from Young UK. And what a great bunch of people we've had speaking so far. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought I might feel a little bit out of place at a Young UKIP conference, but you've held it in the right place. You've got these paintings of slightly older, slightly tubby men with lots of hair, so <laughs> I'm feeling a bit more comfortable. And I'd like to say thanks to George, Sebastian, Nate, and all the other people that have organised this conference, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, now, various topics I want to touch on. Now, first of all, we've heard a bit about UKIP and where it's been and where it's going. I won't touch too much on the past, because some of it is uh, in the more recent past is best forgotten and moved on from. But we have revived the party over the last eight months, eight or nine months, that I've been the leader. The finances are now secure. We went from imminent collapse to being firmly and comfortably in the black, and that's going up all the time. And it's going up because we are getting new members in all of the time. Uh, I'm not giving away any state secrets, but uh, people were leaving by the thousand when I took on. It continued to dip for a bit. We went down to about 18,000, or maybe even lower than that. And then we're now up to about 23,600, and it's going up all of the time. And one of the things that I'm working on now is to see if we can introduce a low monthly membership fee. Now, like a lot of great ideas, it's sometimes a bit harder to do in practice uh, than it sounds when you think of it. Uh, but we are working to overcome those difficulties now because at the moment membership fee, fee is £30 per year. Um, and what we want to do is to introduce a membership fee of £4 maybe or £5 a month because that's hardly the price of a pint of beer now. Uh, so I don't think a lot of people would balk at that. And what I want to do when we introduce that and find a way of making sure that it works properly is to then have a membership campaigns, recruitment campaigns based on that or based on the political issues, but with that um, advantage of being able to offer a low cost access to being a member of UKIP. I can't see a reason why not we shouldn't have 100,000 members. Can you? And even that is only a fraction of 1% of the entire population of 66 million, pound, 66 million people, so we ought to be able to do that. The Tories have allegedly have 70,000 members. Uh, I think a lot of them are actually dead or gone away and they, they, they just keep them on the books. I, I, don't, I don't know what the Liberal Democrats are, I'm not sufficiently interested to find out. Labour has about, <laughs> Labour has about half a million, but your cat can join for three pounds. <laughs> And I believe several people cats have. And of course, they have had the advantage of uh, 40 to 50 years of left-wing indoctrination in schools, colleges, and universities in order to get that level of membership. So uh, they're doing quite well. I want us to get up to 100,000. I'm not sure I'm the man to do that, but I want to lay down the, the uh, basis where we can actually make that happen. And I certainly hope that I can get it moving forward in great strides uh, by, first of all, making it easy to join, low cost, and then concentrating on the right political issues. Can I say, just say another thing on finance? Because we used to have something called a UKIP's Patrons Club, which at one point had 400 members giving um, £1,000 a year. Like so many other things, it just collapsed and was left to rot. We've revised that, and we've now got about 140 members. That's bring, brought in, well, at least £140,000 and some donations on top. And that's allowed me to employ some staff in the last few months, uh, because for the first few months, I was more or less working on my own. Uh, so that's another great thing. I'd like to say thank you to the Patrons Club. And if anybody wants to be a Patrons Club member, it's a measly £1,000 a year. <laughs> and you get to have lunch with me and things like that, so it's a bargain. Now, also on the political front, we are moving forward. We've got local elections next year. We want thousands of candidates in those. Kirsten Herriot, our new chairman, is now at the forefront of recruiting those candidates. And we don't know when we're going to have a general election. 
There might be a snap election, we might not have one for another three or years or so, but we have to have the candidates in place now. As leaders before me have said over and over again, it's no good turning up at a general election, putting a candidate in place and expecting any, to get anywhere. You've got to choose candidates now. You've got to have them out doing a little and often putting leaflets out, having street stalls and work a constituency for a couple of years before the general election to hope to get anywhere. We might not have a couple of years, so we have to start now. So please help your branch to select candidates. Either be one yourself or help them uh, put them in place. And one thing we're going to do is we're going to target some seats. And those seats are going to be where we have remain MPs in leave seats because we are going to take those seats away from them. <laughs> and some of them are on quite small majorities. Uh, we'll say something about policies because uh, those of you who were at the conference, and I hope you've seen since we introduced the new manifesto, uh, interim manifesto, policies for people, about 20 pages of policies in which um, there was a joint effort here. I sat down and started to write policies. Uh, the chairman then, Tony McIntyre, went round the branches and got them to send in their policy ideas which were then uh, collated and analysed by a member of the NEC. And I'm pleased to say the two things almost exactly converged. What the membership wanted was what I was drafting in the manifesto, and they all fit together very nicely. We want to be a populist party in the real meaning of the word. We want our policies to be popular with the general population. Why wouldn't you? I mean, have you, I'm sure you have noticed, the word populist is now a pejorative term. And why is that? It's because the political establishment and the media establishment know the things that they're trying to force on the peoples of Europe, not just the UK, are deeply unpopular. Therefore, when political parties come along, as they are now across Europe, proposing policies that are popular with the people, they must be bad people, mustn't they? because they want to do things like actually run their economy for the benefit of their own people and not because they happen to be in this idiotic straitjacket called the single currency. They actually want to be able to spend money on essential services and not have to be constrained by these policies that say you can't spend money because we have to pay it all to the central banks to pay back the money we have borrowed from them so we can keep the single currency in place. And they want to control immigration. Now, this was touched upon earlier on uh, by a speaker. There is something called the Marrakesh Declaration, and there's going to be something ca coming through the Parliament, I believe the end of this year or early next year, called the UN Compact on Global Migration. Safe, orderly, and regular migration. And I can tell you what it looks like. I've got two minutes next week in Strasbourg to talk about this, and believe me, two minutes in the European Parliament is a luxury. Normally we only get 60 seconds. This global compact, if you were going to have one, you'd have one that actually controlled immigration, wouldn't you? And tried to address the problems causing immigration. And your first priority would be to protect your own countries from massive influxes of millions of people. No, that's not what they want to do. <laughs> they have a solution to illegal immigration. And I bet you can guess what it is. Make it legal. It's a fantastic idea, because what they're going to do is to actually encourage it. They are going to remove the barriers to migration. They're going to make it much easier to do. They're going to simplify it. They are going to remove barriers from removing people once they've turned up. You won't be able to turn a boat back from coming ashore. Uh, you'll have to let everybody come ashore and then process each one individually. And when they've done all that, they intend to criminalise opposition through racist and xenophobia laws, so that even when it's happening, you won't be able to criminalise that you won't be able to criticise it. This is coming along. Some countries have already heard have refused to sign up to this. Hungary, uh, Croatia, I believe, and a few others. Uh, and of course, the, the betting is that Mrs May probably would sign up to it. If you think you've seen mass immigration in Europe in the last 10 years or so, you haven't seen anything yet. 
It is intended to bring people in by the million. And you have to say that this is a deliberate policy in order to completely change the makeup, the culture, the politics of the countries of Europe and to turn them into something else. And of course, we are not opposed to immigration. We want a, 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 an appropriate level of immigration, but that must be something now that is strictly limited and strictly controlled and where it is in interests of the British people. So if we have a shortage of doctors or engineers or something like that, yep, yeah, we can have people come in. If we have a shortage of people to pick vegetables in the summer, we give people work permits. They come in, they do the job, they get paid well and they leave. That's an immigration policy. What we have is an invasion and settlement policy where we invite people in by the million, no questions asked. Now, like I said, UKIP has to move on or stagnate. And I'm not suggesting that we do anything that's removed from our founding principles or the principles we've had for the last 25 years. Those principles will stay the same. And what are they? We want to live in an independent, democratic, self-governing nation. We want to live under our law, English law and Scottish law. We want to live under our institutions, our parliament, and we believe in parliamentary democracy. Dem democratic government and the great you know sometimes I uh, I'm asked to talk to to uh, audiences and the sub on the subject of democracy and how do you tell when a country is democratic or not it's very simple they all have different systems you've got you know we have a constitutional monarch we have an elected parliament we have the first past the post system other countries have a president they have a proportional representation system how do you know if it's a democracy or not very simple you can sack the government if you can't sack the government, you don't live in a democracy. Our government is the European Commission and we can't sack it. We no longer live in a democracy. And if we're going to change UKIP and if we're going to move forward, then we have to have younger people because you can do things that uh, people like me can't. You understand social media and you can make it work. Now, uh, some, Enoch Powell was mentioned earlier and he had a famous quotation which was, uh, po politicians complaining about the media makes about as much sense as a sailor complaining about the weather. Well, that was true 50 years ago, but it isn't so true now because in his day there was only one mainstream media, the newspapers and about three television channels. Now we have alternative media. The mainstream media are part of the problem. They propagate, they, they, there is, journalists are a self-selecting class. I've, I've known people that work to the BBC, they say you wouldn't get an interview if you didn't walk in carrying a copy of The Guardian under your arm. You will not get an interview, you will not get a job in a newspaper, in a, uh, a TV station, a radio station unless you can be trusted to stay on message and that, you, that these people are selecting themselves from this class of people who believe in all the politically correct um, left-wing dogmas of the day. They're not all like that. You will get exceptions, obviously. I'm not tiring them all with the same brush. But predominantly, the mainstream media are not there to tell you what is going on. They are not there to inform you. They are there to influence the way you think and the outcomes of elections. And we see this in more and more blatant ways. You may have seen my adventure on the uh, Politics Live show recently, where the presenter, Joe Coburn, became so enraged that at the end of it she lost all control and uh, said that I was promoting violence. When in 26 years in active politics have I ever done that? Never. But it doesn't matter because the, their job is to actually make people uh, not like you and vote against you and that's what they do. Well, we don't have to rely on them anymore. We've got the alternative media, and I'm very pleased that we've got some brilliant proponents of that on side now, some in the audience today. We've heard Jonathan give his brilliant speech. We've got um, uh, Mark, me in there, the account Dankula. Very, he does a great speech. He'll be very entertaining, I'm sure. And, and of course, we've got Paul Joseph Watson and Sargon of the CAD, Carl Benjamin. Brilliant 
people at using the media. And that's what we have to do. Now, what does, P what does UKIP offer young people and uh, the young voters? Well, we offer you a future. One of the most idiotic arguments put forward in the referendum or after the referendum result was this idea that old people had stolen your future. And when they had the big demonstration in London a, a month or so ago, uh, when I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people were supposed to have turned out, inadvertently I found myself walking beside it in order to get somewhere else because the tube station was blocked. And Vince Cable was up on a screen and he came out with this same nonsense that these old people had stolen young people's future. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth. It's old people that mean you've got a future. It was the people of a hundred years ago who meant that we weren't dominated and conquered by the Germans. It was the people of my father's generation that made sure that we weren't conquered by the Nazis. And of course, everybody since who've gone to work, earned a living, paid the taxes, raised a family, obeyed the laws, these are the people that meant that all of these uh, left-wing, middle-class idiots who kind of demonstrate outside our meetings actually have a free society to live in, a free society that they're only too pleased to actually destroy. So, I actually was always thought that uh, membership of the European Economic Community, which was never a common market, by the way, it was known as a common market, it was always had a political intention. I was proposed to us joining back in 1972. We did join 1st of January 73. I actually voted to leave in 1975, and I have been completely consistent since UKIP was founded, that the only way we're ever going to leave is through unconditional withdrawal and we have to be in charge of the process. I'll come on to that, I'll come on to that at the end, but what are we promising young people? Well, first of all, the, abil the ability to live in a free country, because if you can't sack your government, if it doesn't make any difference, if your vote doesn't make any difference, and you can't have any effect on the government and the parliament that rule you, then what is the point of having a vote in the first place? And you don't live in a free country, as I've said. And we actually want to produce jobs and prosperity for young people. I believe absolutely, without any doubt in my mind, that we will be better off when we leave the European Union. We can get rid of the common agricultural policy, get rid of the f common fisheries policy. We can regenerate those industries. As, as uh, Ernie said, only 5%, I think, of all of the businesses in this country actually trade with the EU. 95% of them are concerned with the domestic economy. Let's get rid of all the idiotic regulation, that, not all of it, but all the unnecessary regulation that they have to labour under. Make it easier for them to employ people and expand. Because Ernie's quite right. Most people begin their working career working for a small business, as I did 40-odd uh, years ago. Without that, I wouldn't have had the experience to move into a big company. We have to create jobs at the ground level so that people can move up. And that's what we are offering to young people. And I think we're offering something else as well, which we've heard a lot about already today. And this is this issue of freedom of speech. I think that we're moving into a very dangerous place now uh, of intolerance and insanity even, where you're not allowed to have opinions. Yeah, when I was growing up, and until fairly recently, the idea that, well, we still live in a free country was something that you could say with confidence that it was actually true. I don't think it is true anymore. We now, re now have this, uh, these ideas of being labelled if you actually support some policy. If you want to control immigration, then you must be a racist. If you want to, if you th actually think membership of the European Union is a bad idea and we leave, you must be an xenophobe because you hate foreigners. And of course, if you have any of these ideas lumped together, then you must be far right, mustn't you? Always avoiding, of course, the fact that um, the people who follow Jeremy Corbyn are far left. That's never touched upon, uh, genuinely far left. That's never touched upon in the mainstream media. 
And this, we had this insanity now, this collective madness of self-identity. Now, I don't care what people do. I'm a, a live and let live person. I don't care if people want to dress up as women or dress up as men. Good luck to them. I hope they have a wonderful time and enjoy the, their lives. But we now have reached a stage where you cannot say the obvious. And it hasn't just got to the stage of free speech, but you have this famous case of a man, sex offender, who identified as a woman. So he had to be put in a women's prison. And uh, there he's sexually assaulting women, and he's ended up in a court. And Alan Craig was telling me this story last night. I didn't see this, but in the court itself, this is in an English court of law with a judge and barristers, and the barrister was saying, describing what happened in the prison, which is this female had a penis which was in a state of arousal. <laughs> Well, if you are allowing that to be said in a court of law, after somebody who is obviously a man and still capable of carrying the functions of a, a biological functions of a man, has been put in a woman's prison, and you can sit and argue this in a court of law, you have reached insanity. Have you not? And how far can this descend? I had a great time yesterday on Twitter because on the news there was this chap uh, in Holland, I think he's 65, and he wants to self-identify as a 49-year-old <laughs> so that he can put that on dating sites. <laughs> and I thought there is... Actually, I did a tweet the other day and I, and I said, send me in your self-identity ideas. I've had 200 nod already and some of them are terrific. And there was two ladies uh, on, the, on Sky News discussing this in complete earnestness. There was one lady there, uh, I don't know what she was, some kind of psychologist or something, or writer, saying that, you know, oh yes, of course, this is all against the general principle thing and only certain people should be allowed to do this. While the other one was saying, oh no, you know, she said, you know, you know your biological age isn't necessarily your real age. <laughs> and, the, and the interview, of course, is, is instead of saying to them, you're actually talking a lot of bollocks. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I know I shouldn't swear, but sometimes I just can't help it. She's actually conducting this discussion which went on for about 10 minutes. And I thought, this is bonkers, where you're living in a country where they can have these discussions. I, personally, I hope he does do it, because uh, I've got loads of self-identity ideas that I'm going uh, <laughs> okay, I, I to... I, I think I'm Roger Moore, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, not now. Ah. <laughs> He is, he is 85 and in a box. I don't want to be that Roger Moore. I want to be Roger Moore in his heyday. So I'm thinking of self-identity. Because I think this idea, you see, I saw this card in a shop, and it's got, it's got, it had these ladies dancing around in strange ways, and it said, when you realise everybody is mad, the world starts to make sense. And this seems to be the society that we're moving into, which I think is precisely why we need UKIP to stand up for the principles of free speech. And I'm not suggesting that we are offensive to anybody, that we're not tolerant of people, because there are people out there with real problems. I don't want to make their lives any harder. But ordinary people have to be able to speak the plain truth without fear of prosecution. And we know that happens now because, as has been mentioned earlier, the hate crime laws. You can now be arrested and convicted of a crime which isn't a crime. It doesn't have to be a crime, it just has to be perceived as a crime, not even by the person that you have allegedly committed this non-offence against, but some el somebody else who observed the non-offence being committed at the time. This is Soviet Union, Nazi Germany stuff. You can be arrested for something which isn't a crime just because somebody thought it ought to be a crime, or they perceived it as a crime. And at the same time this is going on, of course, these, uh, the authorities have for 20 or 30 years been covering up real crimes on a massive scale across the country. Um, and we all know what I'm referring to. And I'll touch on very briefly one issue that did come up. I wasn't intending to talk about it, but I will. Um, one of the person, people who's been instrumental in actually talking about this 
and uncovering it is the famous Tommy Robinson. And of course, I have said on many occasions, I'm not an unqualified uh, supporter of Mr. Robinson. Um, I know him very well, we get on very well. We've discussed things uh, around in all these, these issues. Uh, but I think he's actually a very brave man who's done a fantastically courageous thing. And he has actually stood up and told people what's going on. And the reason that the British public like him, across the social stratas, I don't go around talking about him. People talk to me about him. And one of the things that I've noticed is people from all social backgrounds and classes and incomes groups actually like him. And I tell you the reason they like him is because he's got a quality which they respond to, which is courage. And as Winston Churchill said, I can't remember the exact words, but they were along the lines of, Courage is the most important quality because without it, all the other virtues amount to nothing. If you don't have the courage to implement them, they will come to nothing. And you've seen that somebody, who, somebody like that, whoever they are, but he's the most high profile one, who actually dares to talk about things, will be criticized in the mainstream media, the law will go after them, certainly in his case. And of course, then you will have your Twitter account cut off or your PayPal account suspended or cut off. This is where we're heading now. It's a very dangerous place where people can be victimized like that. And I'm going to close off talking about this by saying, you know my opinion because I've said it on the TV and whatever. I think that we should waive the rule in his case I don't want to get rid of the prescription on the prescribed parties, uh, people who have been members of prescribed parties joining. I want to keep that rule because I think it's a very important rule. It saved us from infiltration. It saved us from a lot of grief over the years. But we do have the ability under the Constitution to waive it in particular cases. I've said I think it should be waived in his case. And I am going to put to the NEC a motion in the near future that says, I want you to conduct a ballot of the membership to ask them if you should waive that rule or not in this country. It's a democratic, we're a democratic party. I'm going to, I'm being told I've got to wind up, so I'm going to, I want to say something about Brexit. We're a democratic party. I'm not a dictator. I'll accept whatever verdict comes out of the membership. Very quickly on Brexit, which I was leaving the best till the end. God help us. <laughs> you vote, everybody voted, majority of people voted to leave back two years ago. What's happened? Nothing. Why hasn't it happened? Because Mrs. May doesn't want us to leave. What you've seen is an elaborate charade where there was never any intention of delivering Brexit. If you'd have wanted to leave, if you had a patriotic Prime Minister, patriotic Parliament, the week after that referendum, they would have repealed the 1972 European Communities Act. They would have said, we've now left under our law. We are now going to tell you how it's going to work. Instead of that, she's constantly gone back and forwards. Oh, how may we leave, please? Oh, you can't do that, Mrs. It's far too difficult. And we're going to end up... Let me tell where you where we're going to end up. We're going to end up with a withdrawal agreement, which is going... So bad, you might as well have not left. And that's why we had another government minister resign yesterday. What she's going to come back with will not satisfy the leavers. It will not satisfy the remainers. It will mean that we in, stay in the European Union to all intents and purposes, even if we do leave technically on the 29th of March. And even that's not certain. And what does that mean? It means UKIP has to stay on the field. We have to be bigger, we have to be stronger, we have to restore the electoral threat that we were back in 2015 and make it even stronger and bigger because only UKIP is fighting for a real exit from the European Union. <laughs> We can only do that if we also appeal on other issues, other policies to the general public. They are not going to vote for you on one issue. We have to do that. We have to be a party that represents the views and interests and needs of ordinary people, ordinary working class people, people who are unemployed but would like to have a job, and small business owners. They're the people that we have to represent.
just to show you I'm up to date with new technology.